We are joined today by someone whom I'm sure does not need any introduction by any search of the imagination, but for the sake of courtesy, we'll give her one. Uh, Katie Herzog. She's the co-host of Blocked and Reported alongside Jesse Single. Of course, I'm sure you've read many of her articles that she's written online. Ms. Herzog, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's Nobody calls me Miss. This is a, a new mm. experience for me. I sort of like it. Oh, really? It. You could actually call me Mrs. <laughs> I am married, so you could actually call me Mrs. Although my, my wife does not share the last my same last name, so I'm not sure if that makes me a, a Mrs. Herzog or a Miss Herzog. Regardless, you can call me Katie. Oh, oh thank you so much. Yeah, okay. um, it gets really complicated with these sorts of things, so um, <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll resort to Katie. But um, yeah. it's interesting. So you host... You're the co-host alongside Jesse Single of Blockman Reported, a relatively new podcast. I think it came out in May, right? That's where the first episode was? Yeah, uh, either April or May. I'm not sure. This whole year is a blur. Time has mm -hmm. uh, time has ceased to have any meeting. So sometime after COVID, <laughs> sometime in the spring. And so, so let's get into the, the meat of this uh, podcast. So uh, I'm really excited to talk with you, especially because we are currently living at one of the most interesting times in the United States. Hey, I'm pretty young, so it's anything at this point is interesting for me. But mm -hmm. um, so we can probably have a conversation about Trump, the bipartisanship of the United States. I, I lose subscribers every time I criticize Trump. Um, it's, it's like a law of physics for me. Since most of our viewers come from our anti-woke positions, they tend to be right-leaning. And so when they hear me criticize Trump, they go, oh, never mind. And they unsubscribe. So one of the things that has happened as of late that I've been able to recognize, and, and this is a difference from 2012 when Obama was in presidency. At the very, I could be wrong because I was pretty young at the time, but my diagnosis of what's been going on is that people seem to be focusing more and more on cultural issues than they were back in 2012. I don't know, is would that be accurate? Would you say? I don't think that's entirely accurate. I mean, cultural issues have always, basically since Reagan, uh, have always been a, like a very big part of American politics. And what Reagan did was, was really sort of a genius political move. Um, Reagan convinced people that it was more important to vote on these cultural issues, things like abortion or prayer in schools, than on economic issues. So this is not entirely a new fight. I think it's gotten more heated in the last few years. And a, and a large part of that reason is the internet and social media. You know, in the 80s, when I was a kid, you didn't have these things. We didn't have cable news. Um, I'm, I'm sure cable news existed, but it wasn't something that my family had, for instance. So people are just this, uh, this, the way that information is, is siloed now, has led to an increase in tribalism. Uh, echo chambers are more entrenched. It's easier to avoid news that you don't agree with. It's easier to avoid people you don't agree with now. Um, and, it, and it wasn't always like that in American culture. But things like, you know, not that long ago, I mean, you mentioned Obama in 2012. Gay marriage was a huge, huge cultural fight in 2012. And I, I don't think a lot of young people realize how how far the U.S. has come in terms of progress. I'm not, I think it's progress because I'm gay. Some people would, you know, think it's a, a like a, a, you know, a or whatever. Um, but in 2012, the idea that gay marriage would be legal in just three years was really an anathema. I didn't think that was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to happen, you know, in, in my lifetime almost. And, and so things have really changed very quickly on that front. Um, but these cultural issues have always been a really big deal, especially things like abortion, um, going back to, you know, the 60s and 70s, birth control women's rights, civil rights, all of this stuff is, is very ingrained in American culture. But now I think we just see it more and we focus on it, um, you know, because we are, we're all online all the time and this is what people tend to care about. Yeah. Oh, that's, I mean, especially if you have a Twitter, it seems like everything is, is a cultural issue. And right. what, what, what's the equation on how, how much we, this was probably, this is like a, probably a strange sounding question, but what's the equation on how much we should focus on cultural issue, whether we're talking about complaining about people who have pronouns in their bio or free speech or censorship how much should we focus on policy because there's some people that strictly focus on policy that think these cultural issues should, sort of just are on the back burner like david pakman and there are other people who say the exact opposite that you know you have the whole breitbart motto that um politics is downstream from culture so if you want to change the political landscape you first have to change the cultural landscape what are your thoughts on this sort of equation what, what do you what are the variables you plug into it that's a really good question. I think that policy, I think we should focus more on policy. 
And I say that realizing that policy is something that I'm less interested in than, than in cultural issues. So I think that's sort of a, a personal flaw of mine is that I, I get sort of more riled up about these cultural issues than I do policy because policy is the, what we vote on is policy. You know, the cultural issues are, of course, a, a, a part of that. Um, but and actually, I, I take that back. What we, we vote on isn't policy, but it should be policy. What we vote on is oftentimes personality, who our friends vote for, um, who has pissed you off online today or whatever. It doesn't tend to be always a, a rational decision. Um, and I think if we voted on policy, people would be a little bit more rational about that. Um, so while I'm, I'm deeply interested in these cultural issues, I frankly find them more interesting than policy. I do think that it is a detriment that, that people like me and maybe people like you focus more on these things on, on Twitter and, uh, you know, and these sort of like inner scene fights than, than we do on, on what's actually happening at, at a government level. And, and part of that is just because it's more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I 100% agree. And, um, and, and that, that seems to be opposed to what I do since a lot of my content is very critical of the sort of critical method, you know, stuff that's going on at the academy. And that's not necessarily because I think it's the most important, but it's the thing that I'm most, um, the, the thing that I'm most familiar with. So, you know, sure. I'm in the academy, I'm in the university, I see this stuff happening all the time, and I feel like I'm more, I'm better equipped to talk about that than something like policy issues, where sure. a lot of it just goes over my head. And so there I are, just, I mean, the, sorry to interrupt you, but there yeah, are, you know, in a lot of ways, Bright Bright is right, the idea that, that, that policy is downstream of culture. And you can see that right now in the Biden administration. Um, obviously, you see it in the Trump administration, too. But right now, I voted for Biden. I, uh, I, I wrote pieces about why people should vote for Biden. For me, a, a vote for Biden was really a vote against Donald Trump. Um, not that I particularly like Joe Biden, but I just really don't like Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Like, I think most Americans, at least most Americans who voted for him, it's not like there was this like passionate, uh, surge because people love Joe Biden. It was really a response to the Trump administration. Um, but just, you know, Biden isn't even in office yet. And he's, uh, he's issued these policy plans that I think really are terrible that are that are going to be bad could could potentially be disastrous if they're already implemented it depends on what happens in the senate of course um and they're cultural issues so things like for instance title nine right so this is a policy issue that t joe biden the biden i'm sure you guys know the biden but for your listeners the biden administration or the obama administration um and and specifically joe biden push these reforms to Title IX that made it really difficult for people accused of sexual assault on campus to get a fair hearing. And this is this has become a cultural issue. It's a policy issue, but it's also a cultural issue. And it pits, you know, feminists against people who are in favor of civil liberties. And already Joe Biden, it looks like, will be, you know, Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, uh, reform this, reform this, these Title IX policy policies. And Joe Biden, it looks like, will probably immediately um, revoke that. So th it is both, right? This is culture and this is policy. And what we're going to be what we're going to be seeing is, who, you know, depending on who Biden appoints and also Harris, her influence in the administration, which I think is is honestly more troubling than Biden himself. What we'll be seeing is if they bring people into this administration who are that who have those particular cultural positions um, you know, people who are, who are, who are feminist oftentimes, and not that I think there's any, well, not that I think that feminism is a bad thing, um, but I do think in this particular way, it's, you know, this position is, is morally incorrect, um, then this will have an impact on policy. So, you know, it's all, it's all very connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right. I, I'd be hard pressed to think of a single person on this planet who released, a, like, finally breathed it in and said, oh, Biden is finally where he should be. I, I think very few people w would believe that. I'm sure there are people out there, though. Maybe but, Biden. Maybe Biden. And I'm not even may, sure if Biden would, may, would feel yeah. that way. And I think all the eyes should probably be on Kamala Harris because yeah. the expectation is that Joe Biden said that he's only going to run. He's only going to be a one term president. That's what he said. He could be wrong. Um, and so if that's the case, then the expectation would be that Kamala Harris would be the runner up for president in 2024. And so. Right. That's going to be one. I think that's going to be important culturally, for sure. But policy wise, I mean, people had concerns with her policy wise because of her of her history, of her background. 
And she isn't the sort of populist left-wing candidate that many people wanted her to be. She was pretty centrist, and that's probably the reason why Joe Biden picked her in the first place. You got the intersectional well, points from... Uh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, th- yeah. I mean, the reason that he picked her was because of her race and her sex. I mean, he said this, that, you know, th- the thing that frustrates me about that, uh, not that she isn't qualified, but the thing that frustrates me about about Kamala Harris, not besides her, her policy positions, is that... She did not do well in the Democratic primaries. So he chose a, an underperforming candidate and handpicked her and said, you will be the next president of the United States after me. And I find that immensely frustrating, that she is not someone who the party chose. She's not someone who the people chose. But she has been now put in this position where in four years from now, she could easily be the next president of the United States, even though nobody nobody chose her. You know, I mean, like, it's shocking that people chose Biden, but even fewer people chose, chose Harris. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway. You see Tulsi Gabbard just destroy her in the debates. I, I, I you know, I, I was very surprised that like, well, okay, I wasn't super surprised, but yeah, I, I, I was just amazed that um, that he picked her uh, to be his running mate, um, even though I didn't think there really was a logical choice at that yeah. point. Now, I... <sighs> So I follow Sarah Hyder on Twitter, and she put my feelings on this matter um, uh, in, 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 into words. I am satisfied that Trump lost. I am very nervous about what I see coming in from the, um, the through, through, through Democrats and what they represent on the cultural left. Um, they some say that you know the the results of the election. There's an increased minority turnout for Trump and a lowering of white people who who voted for, who, who voted for him. And um, with the with the nature of the results, it seems to int- uh, it seems to indicate that there's much more of a of a of a of a centrist minded um, overall community in America itself. But there's as someone who's had his nose right up in the face of the woke the last couple of years, I am not convinced that this is the case. I'm really concerned about what's going to happen moving forward. Not just in our, not just in our social norms. The bottom line is Trump is not going anywhere. Um, and we could be just throwing more fuel onto the fire for what's going to happen in four years. I, I, I don't, I, as 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 pessimistic as this sounds, I don't think these these next four years is going to be a um, is going to uh, is going to yield the, res- the kind of results that people really want. I think we're just setting the stage for something even bigger in twenty twenty four. I don't see anything happening to to really um, return us to sanity. Uh, w- what do you think about that? I think you might be right. I mean, I'm a natural pessimist, so my thinking sort of goes where yours is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about this sort of this, like, for lack of a better term, woke ideology being institutionalized in the federal government. I think it could be really, really disastrous, and specifically in uh, in things like the Department of Education, because education it's already endemic in education. If you talk to people who go to who have who have masters of teaching if you talk to them about their programs these programs most of them across the u.s are threaded through with 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 critical theory um and not i don't think there's a lot of analysis there it's just sort of ex- this acceptance that this is the one true way right and you see this and you see this in policy you see this in school boards you see this in state boards of education um and i think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that and you know i think that it's things like woke segregation i think it's possible that this will you know become become institutionalized in the federal government it's terrifying yeah i saw yesterday on twitter biden has named somebody i can't remember who it is somebody um to as part of his transition team who was he was like the former editor of time magazine and he has argued in favor of hate speech laws hate speech laws in the u.s that's that's disturbing. It's really disturbing. We, you know, hate speech laws are, are in direct contradiction to the First Amendment. The good thing is that we have the First Amendment, right? So even if Biden appoints someone who, uh, you know, who argues that we need like more hate speech legislation, that person would still have to be would have to run up against the First Amendment, right? And I don't see any chance of the First Amendment getting overturned, you know, if the Democrats have like an overwhelming majority in Congress and the Supreme Court, maybe, but we're not in that position. And it's going to be a long time before the Supreme Court, uh, it it leans, you know, uh, leans left. And those are, there's a reason we have this system, right? It's cumbersome, it's huge, it's bureaucratic, but these are the checks and balances that we need. You know, 
I, I, I'm sort of shocking that I say this. I want, I want Democrats to take the Senate because I want to see real progress on things like climate change and environmental policy and some other issues, healthcare, um, these other issues that really do matter just as much as not more than these cultural issues. Uh, you know, having clean air, having clean water, having like, you know, all of these things that really do have an impact on people's lives more so than, you know, than these culture issues also. A lot of these culture issues are sort of, there's a certain, a certain demographic that cares about them, right? It's sort of a class issue. If you're a poor person working four jobs and you can't get childcare because of, because your kids aren't in school and you can't afford it and someone gets COVID, that's way more important than, than like pronouns and bio, right? I mean, we need to have some perspective on these things. Um, and, and so I want, I want the, I want the Democrats to take the Senate because I do want to see real progress on these, these incredibly important issues. But that said, I will also, I will also admit, um, and, and the younger me would be appalled that I'm saying this, that I don't want to see the Democrats have the, you know, the House, the Senate, the White House, and the Supreme Court. Um, because any, any one party with that, with that amount of power is just too much. I agree. And, um, I, I, I am appalled that, um, we, that um ruth Bader ginsburg just recently passed away and like we now have a, a conservative dominance on the supreme court but um i this all all this is brought into perspective by the idea that we do have wokeness running around rampant and um you know I, I, like you katie like when i was younger i, I would have been like oh my god like it's all conservative like um i was i was born in the 80s and um, this would have been a disastrous blow to um, to, to, to to gaining um, uh, to gaining gay getting gay rights. But uh, what I'm it's tempered now by the realization that the that the woke has has gone amok, and um, that we've had that we have a lot of um, uh, social momentum and sentiment towards progressivism in general that i think that there's enough momentum for those for, for those ideas to carry the day and survive but what will not survive without these institutional powers is um our ability to maintain the principles that allows it to thrive like the first amendment and um you know as you said these you know it seems like what a critical theory anything that just hurts your feelings is it, it counts as hate speech nowadays which is pure nonsense right. Right. I think you're totally right about that. And one difference between the 80s and the 90s and now is that the culture really is dominated by the left, um, which was not which was not true in the 80s. And it wasn't true in the 90s when in the, the early 90s when I was a kid and, you know, Desert Storm was happening. Um, it wasn't true after 9-11 when there was this uh, when the zeitgeist was very much more nationalist. And even though people hated George Bush, it wasn't this overwhelming um, this overwhelming sort of sort of dominance by by the conservative um, agenda the way that it is by the by the left now. And there was a um, whenever people say that we really need to take a breather and not focus too much on these cultural uh, woke issues because they, they really aren't that big of a deal. They're not that important. I'm reminded of there was an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that came out a few months ago by a theoretical physicist. And he said that that was the same mentality that people had in the 90s. Where, yes, this, this idea of deconstructivism was always there. It was only in the humanities, but so long as it remained there, it wasn't that big of a deal. And now we're seeing it pestilentially spread into STEM and obviously pestilentially spread into the government. So I don't know what is uh, what exactly is enough power for them. If you don't see the way that this is manifesting itself in fields and academic disciplines that it has no business manifesting itself in, I don't understand what exactly is required for you to change your mind that we should probably focus on this at least a little bit. If we you know, we don't have to focus in on more than we do on policy, but it certainly deserves some attention. Sure, and, absolutely. Yeah. And someone like Kamala Harris, I think you could make a strong argument that she's only going to fuel this. <laughs> Not because she has pronouns in her bio, but because she is very sympathetic towards these ideas. So one of the things that concerns me is that... If Joe Biden doesn't run in 2024 and we're looking at a potential Kamala Harris presidency, I'm not convinced that Trump won't run in 2024. Well, first of all, Trump's going to be super old, so right. who knows? But I wouldn't be surprised if even at the age that he is in 2024, he still functions better, cognitively speaking, than Joe Biden functions now. And given that what we know about Trump, his narcissism, his pathological narcissism, I wouldn't be surprised if he wants to run in 2024. Trump said... And he makes this claim. I don't know if it's true, but he says that if he loses, we'll never see him again. I I, I yeah. doubt that. 
I yeah. doubt that. Yeah. Um, but if that's the case, if we're looking at Kamala Harris versus Trump, are you confident that the Democrats can keep the presidency or given how insanely popular Trump is and how well he did, how well he performed, we could be looking at Trump again in 2024? It's totally possible. I mean, anything could happen in the next four years. I mean, just like the pandemic itself shows you how quickly and and drastically things can change sort of overnight. So really, who knows what's going to happen in the next four years? Um, I'd rather not think about the next four years. I want to stop thinking about campaigning. You know, just I'm so sick of presidential campaigns. This one has been going on since like 2014, and I just want to breather from it. Uh, but I think it's concerning. And, and Harris... You guys would know more about Harris's uh, performance than I do, being in California. But my impression of her is that she is um, she's less of an ideologue, which is I think good. I, ideologues terrify me. Then she is a panderer, and she will go where the wind blows, and that's also terrifying um, in a different way because right now. The mood among, you know, uh, among sort of the elite class is, is progressive in this way that's very dogmatic and, uh, and doctrinaire. And you'll see this in like, the, like the Warren campaign. You know, Elizabeth Warren hired all of these woke 20 and 30 somethings who really steered her in the wrong direction. But these are the people who have cultural power. These are people who work in the media. Um, they work at nonprofits. They, these are the people who, they don't actually represent the, you know, the actual like American person, the American people at all. Uh, but they do, they do really influence the narrative. And if, if Kamala is surrounded by these people, my fear is that she will just sort of follow along with them. Um, because it's, if you, if you exist in this, in this world that, that, that politicians do and that people in the media do, you exist in echo chambers. So Joe Biden didn't win because he appealed to the, to the work, woking class. He appealed because he won because he appealed to black voters in South Carolina, right? That was really the thing that changed that that changed the the primary for Joe Biden was was South Carolina. He was not performing well before then, um, and and black voters in South Carolina are not deeply progressive. They tend to be more conservative um, than you know than than white voters in a lot of ways. Um, and so my fear is that they will forget that they will forget that the, the the ideology. The reason that Joe Biden won was not because he was an extremist; it was because he was a moderate, and also because of his connection with Barack Obama, name recognition, all of that stuff. There's many, many different forces. This is not. Um, there's no. There's never one cause for anything. Um, but if they are if they are trying to appeal to the media um, and to the people who control the cultural conversation, what they're going to do is they're going to swing swing left. And and I, I almost hate saying left because it's not really a leftist position. It's an authoritarian position. Um, and so that's what I'm concerned about. You know, for me, the calculus was really, I was a single issue voter and that issue and was getting Donald Trump out of office. So voting for Joe Biden wasn't hard. That decision wasn't hard. But I'm not sure that Joe Biden is going to be, it, I'm not sure that the, that the outcome is going to be good. Um, it was still worth it to get Trump out, I think, at this point. But uh, I'm not totally convinced that, that this will be ultimately good for the country or for the world. But we're also saying that, you know, uh, 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 Harris is, like you said, a, um, a panderer. Um, and she does have... Like, like like Elizabeth Warren, like um, when when she had those woke, the the Wokarati um uh, 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 steer her 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 her, her, um, her, her campaign, um, what as you said, like oh, Biden's um, moderation seems to have won him the day. Now, since he appealed to um to 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 to, to, to black voters, what I find very very curious is that um you know Biden does not want to defund the police, which is one of the worst, which is absolutely one of the worst marketing schemes that Democrats could have come up with at this, at this kind of time. But that appeal to moderation, again, seemed to appeal to a more moderate and frankly, a smarter America than like we, than, than we all feared. So knowing that you know, um, some stats would say that um, most uh, most African Americans do not want us to defund the police, we, 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 I mean, there, there's a strong argument to be made for reform. So that we have this um, this 
powerful woke way, but there's this bedrock of um, seem, which seems to be common sense lying out there. So, you know, uh, um, Harris seems to be a, a, a relatively intelligent person. And like, how do you think she's going to like um, try to keep up um, this uh, propensity she has for pandering as opposed to like saying, you know what, realistically, this is what people, this is what really wants. This is what's really going what, what, to win his votes. Um, That's the question. Think, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It depends on who she's going to listen to. If she's going to listen to the, the voters or if she's going to listen to the media. And, and it also depends on, on who her advisors are. Um, it, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, best case scenario, they look at the results of the election and they realize that there's a reason that, that Joe Biden won and not Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Um, worst case scenario, they pay a lot of to a lot of attention to what's happening on Twitter and they decide that those are the people that they don't want to piss off. Yeah, Andrew um, so Yang I, is the only candidate who seems to really get it. Uh, yeah. He sat out and fly on CNN saying like, look, um, now no, I'm, I'm kind of sort of paraphrasing him here, but it's like, yeah, the cultural issues are important, but you know, if you keep going at it the way you've been going at it, you're going to piss off more and more people. And then yeah. Um, who, 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 who may not be racist, who, who, who have genuine concerns that need to be addressed. And well, they're running off a losing, uh, they're running off a losing narrative. Yeah, I think, I think Yang is, is, is really good on this stuff. He announced right after the election that he and his wife were moving to Georgia for a couple months to, to work on this. And I, I think that's a mistake. Um, I'm from the South and, uh, and the South historically does not like it when people, um, come in and, and try to dictate their politics. There's a term for that. We call them carpetbaggers. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a term from, have you guys heard that term before? Not in that context. Okay, right. So this is a this is a it's a historic term going back to the Civil War, um, and and so I so my fear is that the Democrats or the Republicans sending a bunch of people out of state out of staters to Georgia to to try to influence this election is going to have the opposite effect. I could be wrong about that. I'm hope I hope that I am wrong about that, um, but I I do not think that that is necessarily a winning position um, because people want it's this race is incredibly important for the country, of course, but. It's also state politics and people want, you know, want representation that that uh, that stands for them and not just this, these bigger national issues. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, trying to sort of understand why Trump won the presidency is it will probably require some really crazy math and you know, theories that are really difficult to put your finger on because there's just so many reasons why. But one of the things that some people try to point towards and say is that what Trump was was he was emblematic of something in the American consciousness that politicians haven't recognized yet. So we have generally, like, you know, we have the populist left, um, and, and there, there's some representatives for, for there, but no one really on the right. Uh, no one basically that we could say would be a perfect combination of, you know, Rush Limbaugh anti-expertise sentiments and Tucker Carlson concern for the working class. So if that's the case, and I don't know if it is, but... If that's the case, if that's part of the equation of why Trump got into the office, could we be looking at a new right, one that is more concerned with the working class? I think I think so. I mean, it is possible that the right, ironically, could come up with this sort of multi-ethnic working class coalition that the Democrats have been trying to build for, you know, for decades, um, which would be incredibly ironic, but also sort of depressing. Um, you know, and, and maybe these labels don't really matter. You know, if the, if the, if the Republicans, if the right actually did manage to build this sort of, you know, multi-ethnic working class coalition and their policies ref were reflective of that, is that such a bad thing? I mean, these parties do switch, switch, switch positions, switch terms. I mean, it, it is, it is true that, that the party, the anti-racist party in the 19th century was the Republicans. Um, these things do evolve. Uh, you know, and I think what we're seeing right now is that, you know, Democrats used to be sort of the party of unions and the working class. And now the perception is that Democrats are really more the party of the elites. Um, you know, and that is reflected in, in polling in terms of, you know, Biden wins the, the educated vote. Democrats win the educated vote by a landslide. Um, yeah, so I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens. And maybe if we cared less about labels and had, and, and tribalism, 
then it wouldn't really matter as long as there is a, you know, there is a party that that actually does represent the, the interests of the working class. Maybe it wouldn't matter. It's hard for me to imagine Mitch McConnell, you know, being at the helm of that. Um, it's actually impossible for me to imagine that. Um, but maybe that maybe that'll be what happened. Yeah, who knows? Um, and, and on that topic, you wrote an interesting article criticizing Dave Rubin whom I'm sure would have me blocked if he listened to the things that I've said about him on this podcast. <laughs> but you criticized him for saying that the left is now loony and we should move right because that is the natural position when it comes to defending freedom of speech and all the values that we truly care about. And you argue that, no, we should hold our ground. But I've heard a surprisingly large number of people resemble the same sentiment that Dave Rubin has, that maybe we need to jump ship. And if we cannot reform the Democratic Party or the liberal aspect, we could at least reform conservatism, one in which it is open towards LGBT concerns, one in which it is open to some populist concerns that really only seem to manifest themselves on the left. So from a pragmatic standpoint, maybe it would be better to jump ship and go the conservative route. I'm yeah. assuming you would probably disagree with that. Um, but what is your general take on that? I, so it's a it's a really interesting issue. I think we need to be realistic, however, about what the right actually does stand for. And right now, the right has has staked out. Some people on the right have staked out this position of being in favor of things like due process and free speech. That is only because they are the ones who are being who are most being censored and harmed by this issue. And they sense that it's a weakness on the left. It's a weak point, and therefore they're capitalizing on it. I do not think that Donald Trump or Mitch McConnell or almost any any Republican, anyone in the GOP, is actually a, a genuine believer in, in free speech for the sake of free speech. I think it's pragmatic. Um, and, I, and I don't know that they would be defending, you know, the rights of people to, uh, you know, uh, burn the flag or shit on the Bible or whatever. Like it's not, so I think both sides are, the difference is that right now the right doesn't have cultural power. And when you're in a position of having less cultural power, that's when you start to care about these, about the ideals, right? The institutions, the values of free speech, because if you don't, if you don't have any power, you need the, you need the values to hold um, so that you aren't censored. So I, I'm cynical about the right. And, you know, this is, this is the party the, the Republican Party has not changed that much. Um, you know, there are these, these sort of, on these cultural issues, they are moving to the left. But when it comes to, you know, things like regulation, and I'm in, I'm in some, in some things I'm in favor of deregulation. I don't think people who braid hair need to have a license for it. But when it comes to things like the environment and climate change, um, the right has really not shown itself at this point. Uh, to be in a position to take up, to, they're, they're not take, taking progressive positions and, and on these things that really are going to require regulation. Um, you know, if, if, and I, I, there are like, there's a guy, there's a student at the University of Washington. His name is Benji something. I can't remember his last name. Who is, who is a, a who's a, a climate guy. He's, he's an environmentalist. He's also a conservative. And he's trying to build a young coalition of, of, of a coalition of young conservatives who who care about things like climate change and the environment. Um, maybe he'll have some success, but he's going going to be going against you know decades of, of institutions um, of Republican institution that is really far more on the side of big business and and oil and coal and all of that stuff. And you, I mean, you can see just from from Trump's environmental policies, which he's mostly decimated regulations and done things that you know just are favors to, to the coal industry um, and the fossil fuel industry so i'm i'm very skeptical that the right is anything but um opportunistic in this particular but as you said that we we um the, the political positions and constituents of the parties and the and even the spectrum changes over time like from lincoln's time to you know the most recently we had um in the 1960s barry goldwater's uh, his his southern strategy just seemed to cause a major paradigm shift it um more I, I think you know knowing knowing what i know it, is that it caused a, the, um, the democratic party being, to be almost exclusively liberal and like the republicans to be almost entirely conservative um i think that um, with how crazy the left has gotten, it might cause yet another paradigm shift, and, there, and therefore it, it could force an evolution in the right wing to where it, it would be completely insane to imagine now, but the constituency of the Republican Party could be reformed into something that, that is much more 
um, accepting of of, 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 of of liberal qualities to make it to almost to make it almost a liberally conservative party, so to speak. Um, this, especially since like people feel backed into a corner. I mean, I know um, liberals who who, um, who, who, who who voted for Trump who were just written off as racist or or or, 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 or whatever. So, um, you know. Some uh, some individuals I follow on Twitter could see an opening for the Republican Party to you know, to to be to 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 replenish itself by opening itself up to these new culture to do to these um, to these new cultural norms while rejecting the batshit craziness of the woke, of, of the woke left. Um, so you know, is this a possibility? I I, I mean I, I do see this because I I um I I tend to you know I'm around several conservatives despite being a liberal myself and like oh, th their views are in general fairly liberal it, yeah it, it yeah yeah it, i think it is possible what the what i think the right will be going against is age right so if you look at just polling of of you know demographics of who young people are young people are overwhelmingly liberal um so i and i don't see that changing um and i don't and i also don't think that i think that right now Zoomers in particular, millennials and Zoomers, don't have the sort of old school liberal values that I have, right? So they might not see, they, they have not been around at a time when, uh, when free speech has been challenged in a way that it is now. They think that, and of course I'm generalizing here, but oftentimes, you know, they value, they think that hate speech is more important, that, that regulating hate speech is more important than the value of free speech. I don't see, I think that is more, is more dominant than the sort of anti-woke position. So we'll see what happens. Um, you know, the title shouldn't matter. The name shouldn't matter, whether you're Republican or Democrat, but obviously they do. I mean, if we did away with this, if, the, the system is also so flawed because it's, it's a binary in, the, in terms of the way that we vote. Either you're a Democrat or you're a Republican or you're an independent in which case, or a libertarian or whatever, in which case you don't, you don't really matter. You sort of opted out of, 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 uh, of, of participating in the system as we know it. Um, and that's not going to change anytime soon. But I think that's real, that's the real fundamental flaw is if you're not one, your only choice is the other. Um, you know, so. I'm appalled by a lot of the behavior of, of people on the left, but if my only option is to go vote for the party of Mitch McConnell, that's not an option for me, right? Um, you know, so it, you know, maybe if, you know, Brett Weinstein, Weinstein has this, this third party idea of something like that would actually take hold, I find it very unlikely. Um, not just because of the, the sort of mass support it would require, but also because there are establishments and institutions fighting against it. Um, so I'm not super optimistic uh, that they'll that there'll be some sort of third party movement that arises to take the place of the Republicans and Democrats. Um, and I also it's hard for me to imagine a lot of young people saying like, yes, I want to be a part of the grand old party, at least at this point, even if there is a, you know, a, a coalition of sort of anti woke young folks who um, who who bristle against what's happening right now. Well, I was a uni, I was a uni 2020 guy myself. I, I just think it it came too late uh, to, to make a difference and hopefully that'll continue to get some momentum for 2024 which i think we desperately need but he's but, also uh, i mean he's working against the tech overlords who are who are censoring his platform yeah, um, yeah. which is really difficult i mean I, I do think andrew yang is a really promising figure i think some of his policy positions are a little crazy i do like he wants to put a dojo on every corner i do like that um but you know someone like him someone charismatic uh smart I think Andrew Yang could be a big force, but it's also like American politics is so much is so huge and there's so much bureaucracy and so much intractable institutions and establishments that he's really like fighting an uphill battle. I agree. Katie, I was listening to the podcast last night that you had with Matt Lewis and you know, I one of the, the points I would I really wanted to discuss with you with is just how badly our media has um, just fallen out of touch with um, the general public. So the election is quote unquote over, <laughs> but um, we, we, we're, we haven't even begun to experience just the fallout from it. Like now, as we were talking about before, Biden won, but Trump did not do poorly. 
you know, it, it, that, that shocked the hell out of everyone on on the election night, where like um you saw what Kyle Kalinske calls the red mirage, and was like, oh my god, the sky's falling, and um you know why is this guy still doing that well? And um this is after you you hear these pollsters say, you know what, don't worry about it, we recalibrated. Well, what did you what exactly did you recalibrate to? Um so um. 2016 should have should have taught us a lesson. Uh, there's this, there's a video of this a comedian called Jonathan Pye going um, that was released right after um, Trump got elected. Um, he was just railing um, about the results of the election, like, but just despairing that Trump won. But he also just just flipped. Um, he, he lost his shit at, at, at the left, say, uh, saying like these, these cultural issues ex is exactly what got you Trump. And the, and, and the amount of hate that got that video got was just oh my god, no one's listening to this guy. Um, now the media still seems to, to to be set in that mindset that um, you know what, um, we, we, this is evidence that we live in a racist nation, or whatever. And they don't seem to have taken the lessons to heart at all. And um, so going back to the idea of like. Um, Recalibrating to get the idea of the of the general public. Well, your calibration's off. Like, what rubric are you using to to, cal to calibrate? Like, you know, what, I'm, I'm trying to understand where the headspace of the media is right now. Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that what's going on is that the media is uh, is incredibly homogenous in this particular is like one particular way not uh, not as much racially or ethnically or in terms of sex as it was a, you know a few decades ago but in terms of culture and politics so if you work at a newspaper in new york or dc or seattle or la or san francisco or whatever the likelihood is that you are surrounded by colleagues and friends who are just like you and there's very, very little room for dissent. And you can see this just this week. Matt Iglesias of Vox um, resigned from his position and started a Substack newsletter in part because of this. Um, it's because it's difficult to be the sort of contrarian within an institution like that because people shit on you all the time. And there's a lot of a there's a lot of, you know, an impulse to censor. Um, and so I think that's what ha what's happening is that the media is really homogenous and there are varying degrees. There are sure there are Marxists, there are DSA members, there are leftists, there are, there are liberals and some centrists and a few token Republicans. But the media has turned into a sort of evergreen state university. Right. And when you have people or like a Seattle City Council or a Portland City Council, and when you have no diversity of thought, what you get is a form of extremism. And that happens on the right and the left. This is just a natural thing that happens when you, and there are studies that show this. Um, Connor Friedersdorf wrote a column about this yesterday in The Atlantic, and he cited this study from Cass Sunstein, uh, from, I, it was, it's, it's an older study. I, I can't remember when it's from, but what, what he found was that if you have three liberals in a room together and three conservatives in a room together, when they leave, the liberals are more liberal and the conservatives are more conservative and they're more intractable in their positions. They're less willing to listen to the other side. They're more convinced of their own correctness. And I think that's what happened to the media. There's also this terminal fear of being cast out by your friends and colleagues, right? So if you do something like go profile a Trump voter, you're going to get shit on because we shouldn't be platforming those people, um, which has which has made this has made the media totally unreflective of the American population. And I saw this, I, you know, as a staff writer at The Stranger of Seattle Salt Weekly, and I saw this all the time. You know, we didn't most of my colleagues didn't want divergent opinions on the pages of that paper. And that is a paper that comes from the alt weekly tradition of being sort of radically honest. And that's gone now. That value has, has disappeared from the American media. And then, and then you've got social media, which means that we can easily, you know, the algorithms filter out opinions that we don't like for us, right? So you have to really go out of your way to find divergent opinions. And most people don't do that. And then there are these economic forces, right? So it used to be that if you worked at a newspaper, you were probably, you know, you're a reporter, not a journalist, probably working class. Your parents were more likely to be, say, like plumbers than they were doctors or lawyers or tech executives or whatever. And you would go work a beat for a few years at a local paper, move up maybe to a regional paper, maybe to a national paper. And 
that was the progression, right? This sort of very standard, traditional, you know, uh, it was a working class job. And that's also totally changed now because newspapers no longer exist. So what you get instead is Columbia Journalism School graduates and NYU graduates who go and work for a blog for a couple years, probably a, a, a left a left leaning blog, and then they end up at the New York Times and they take those same values, values that, that lots of times they picked up from their friends on campus that are not the sort of old school, you know, just reporting the facts values. It's much more about activism and about being on the right side of history. So there are all of these different forces that have coalesced and what we have now is a media that, a national media specifically, that doesn't represent the American people, that is totally unequipped to do things like predict the outcomes of elections. And then you don't have local media because these local papers have been totally hollowed out um, in part because of the internet and other economic forces, things like consolidation, local papers get bought by these national, um, these national outlets that are just terrible. They lay everybody off. It's a for-profit model. Um, so, you know, I think that the way to address this is would really take government intervention and funding local sources. And there's there's other models, you know, there's like the Substack model, the Patreon model, but there's problems with that too, where it's been great for me. Um, but there's, there's also a problem, which is that like when I worked at The Stranger, you know, my voice was 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 fed to people who hated it and i felt like that was a service that that the paper provided was putting my voice in front of people who didn't want to hear it um because then you you get you just you see a different opinion even if you hate it at least you're sort of aware of what other people think and that doesn't exist if you have Substack patron, Substack and Patreon, where you can, you know, not only are you not fed this information that you might not agree with, but to access it, you have to pay for it. Um, so it's only going to cre create narrower and narrower echo chambers. I don't think that Vox is better off without Matt and Glacius there. I don't think that The Intercept is better off without Glenn Greenwald there. I think Matt and Glenn are better off, personally, um, not being in those institutions because it's very difficult to be, you know, one of the lone voices in these outlets. Um, but in terms of the publications and, and the public, I think, I think they're going to suffer. Um, because now you have the, you know, the one heterodox thinker is now on his own, making more money, not having to deal with assholes at work. Um, but isn't being, isn't, you know, you aren't forced to confront the fact that, that everybody doesn't agree with you. I mean, the the one bright spot um, I, I see in that is like you know, when you have more and more high profile figures have make those decisions. Like we, we saw that happen to Barry Weiss, and we saw that to, to Andrew Sullivan, who's, who's yeah. another writer whose work I, I, I really enjoy. Yeah. Um, more and more high profile people, they decide to make these decisions. Um, it, it will get the general public to go, "What the fuck? What's right. what, what's going on?" And that, that right. should be enough of a, of a of a shock to say, "Like, whoa, 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 something's going on here." I mean, like you know, Glenn Greenwald was something I didn't see coming. Uh, you know, he left his job at the at the intercept and uh, what i would really like to see is an apology from him to sam harris for him doing this exact same thing and like i think that would be a major game changer for everyone saying like no there's something you know something is not right in our house yeah um yeah. but the, but the reality is there's something very very wrong in both houses and with the, in, in the left and the right which uh, you know i i think the, the what, what, what we've been getting from the left is 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 um in addition to push back to how how bad the right has gotten i mean we have media networks like fox and CNN just catering to their own brand of activism. You yeah. see um, the right uh, on Fox News just strawmanning, you know, people like Dave Room just strawmanning the left and just uh, 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 well, using the using the woke left to, to, to criticize the the the, um, the more moderate left. And you see Don Lemon just mocking Trump supporters um, on on uh, on CNN. Like, how do you think? Yeah. That, like, how does he think that's going to be a winning strategy? Or like, you know, how how's that, how's that going to turn people off? Now, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that what's happening is that people are just there are not employees within these organizations who are going to say you're getting it wrong. And also, it's good for ratings, right? Like, and bad for the republic. You know, it's very bad for the republic, and it gives it gives. Fox News viewers, for instance, the impression that Joe Biden is an anarchist. Anarchist Antifa, they are not for Joe Biden. They don't even vote. Like this, like true believers don't even vote. But there's been this, this conflation of this, of the two. Sorry, my dog is barking. If you watch conservative media, you're going to be left with the impression that 
Antifa is a is a wing of the Democratic Party. That is not true. It is not true. Of course, there are few, there are like some activists who will show up to these protests or whatever, and then go cast a vote for Joe Biden. But these are Antifa exists outside of the mainstream politics, and you don't know that if you watch Fox News. Why? Well, because it's convenient for Fox News. It is good for Fox News to to force their to confuse their viewers. Um, and the same thing happens on the on the on the left where. You know, you have someone like Don Lemon or, or the New York Times or whatever um, saying that all Trump voters are racist. All Trump voters aren't racist. But I um, I know lots of people. I, I would say that the majority of my friends, if polled, would say, yes, all Trump voters are racist. And if I said, what about that black guy over there? He voted for Trump. They'd say, well, internal racism. You know, it's it's serving whiteness. You know, it, it, it both things are ridiculous. They are. But, you know. The example I told. use is um, you know the um the there was a muslim woman um who i i followed for somewhat her, her name is asar nomani who, yeah. who who entered voting for trump i mean she, she's yeah. she's a liberal muslim lady who who ended up voting for him because like the, there was so much sanctimony on the left um you know um calling out rightly so that, that there's a lot of anti-muslim bigotry flying um, flying around but like they wouldn't acknowledge they, they couldn't seem to hold two ideas in their head at the same time that's saying like there's a problem in islam today Right. And we have, but we have to, but in addressing that, we have to be very, very cognizant that there are many great Muslim people out there. And this, this just, to, this, this should not have been so hard to, to hold, but, um, that kind of sanctimony, um, turn, turn, turn her and others like her off. So they ended up voting for Trump. And she's, yeah. she, she's very liberal. Now, um, we, thankfully, thankfully, we have Joe Rogan's podcast and, um, where, you know, his conversation skills are great to the point. And he invites so many left and right people on there and lets them just um talk and there are times in which he, the, the way the way the, 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 the kind of conversationalist he is he ekes out their points and um uh, um lets them occasionally wreck themselves uh, on the air like the, what he did what he did, what he did with candace owens on climate change um now i don't think that's intentional on dave's part no no no, no yeah. not at all not, not oh, oh wait i'm but, sorry you are talking wait are you talking about rogan or ruben i'm sorry i forgot what you said rogan uh, no. rogan, rogan. Yeah. rogan okay yeah, i was thinking like, in my uh, head i was thinking right. wait a second all right Yes, right. I, I need I need to clarify that because I didn't say he did that intentionally, but because of the way he speaks and he no. like, um, because yes. of his intelligence, he was able just to expose Candace Owens on on, on air. And now, he, yeah, um, he's great. Yeah. He just asks. He just asks, right. Rogan is great because he comes from a base level of of realize he has epistemic humility. He realizes that he doesn't understand things and he actually listens. And so I th like a lot of the stuff that he says. I think is incorrect. I think he has fed some misinformation, um, but. By asking questions, he really does listening and asking questions. He really does. People can lay out their positions, and I, he does a great job at it. Yes. Yeah, and um, I I'm I'm of the opinion that you know right now we're, we're in um the, we're in the 2020s. We don't we're not living in Walter Cronkite's era anymore. And like, but I think Rogan's podcast, especially since it's such a, it reaches such a large audience on both the left and the right, is the closest thing we have to it. He's not going anywhere. But Trump, oh my God, he may start his own. Um, news network and it, 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 he's going to try to compete with Fox News and he it, it looks like he's turning on Fox News and um, now we, we see conservatives and Republicans just leaving Twitter for parlor and like um, unbelievably I don't know where they get the information from but like you know being being a former Bay Area resident I still talk to friends and family from up there who think Joe Rogan is a right wing talking point like, what, what is this and then um, we we see more and more ideological siloing through labeling through um, through um, a, a a preference for news sources rather than a preference for exploring truth and uh, to explore clashing ideas. Um, I how do we how do we move into uh, how do we get back uh, to a system of bedrock truth because without um, without, if America continues to see two movies, then we're going to be we're going to be living in completely different worlds, in which are which you know are, we may have similar values, but without the facts, without um, the willingness to explore those, we'll, we'll never come to some kind of cultural or um, some any kind of cultural or, or policy based consensus that'll um, that'll move us forward. And um, without more platforms to Rogan's po like Rogan's podcast. And without the, and what, more importantly, without the willingness to listen to it, I don't see us moving forward. That's the question. And the thing is, these podcasts are opt-in, right? I mean, you're right. We don't have an, a Cronkite thing. And the people who I think most should be listening to someone like Joe Rogan are not listening to Joe Rogan. Um, you know, they think he's a, they think he's a, a Nazi. There was I mean, a. I 
I, not to interrupt you here, but I need to throw in one point. I mean, I had a, literally, I had a conversation with a left leaning friend of mine, not left leaning, he swings over to the left. We were having a, a talk about hate speech laws, free speech, the necessity of it. And somewhere in that conversation, he just said, no, Joe Rogan's right wing, just completely dismissively. And I asked him, okay, give me five positions he's right wing on. He gave me a blank look. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it's like. He likes guns. Yeah, That's an obvious one. But yeah, yeah, Rogan is not right wing. There was a, a out, right after the election was was announced, there was a a piece in the Atlantic by Zenem Tufeki, who I think is generally really pretty good. And uh, the title is something like, um, our next authoritarian president will be worse. And there was a line in this piece about how, you know, who these potential next like authoritarian presidents could be. And she mentioned Tucker Carlson and Joe Rogan. And so it's just like this idea that Joe Rogan, A, would want to be president and B, would win a primary and C, that that he would like go in and immediately become some sort of authoritarian. It sh shows me one thing, which is that she is completely unfamiliar with Joe Rogan's Joe Rogan's work. Um, it's just it's a, that is an impossible. Tucker, I think, could uh, could actually be a very successful politician. Rogan wouldn't want to be a politician. Um, you know, and, and that's and that got published in The Atlantic. You know, and, and so how do we get to back to a balance of truth? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there would have to be some some economic forces would really have to change. It might have to take some sort of some major crash where, you know, the Internet net doesn't exist anymore. And I don't think that's going to happen um, because, the you know, the truth is like we are we are watching different movies, as you put it. And uh, you can get and, and, and this now. This balkanization of media that we see in things like Substack just means it's going to get that much worse. Where you can you can subscribe to five different content creators who agree with you because who is going to pay? Like a podcast, are another example of this. Like my podcast, it has been shocking to me how little hate Jesse and I have gotten because as, when Jesse and I write, oftentimes we are like inundated with criticism. That hasn't happened with the podcast because people don't hate listen to podcasts. People who don't like us are not going to listen to us for an hour. You know, even to like pick out things that are problematic, they're just not going to do it. Um, and so, you know, they ignore it, which has been great for us. But we just... You know, it's just it's this increasingly narrow echo chambers where only the people who like us listen to the show um, or only the people who like Rogan listen to Rogan or watch Rogan or whatever. Have you seen Tristan Harris's social uh, social dilemma? He, he really goes into oh. uh, in, in the depth of like, you know, um, how this is just how this is wrecking us. Like, I haven't watched I haven't watched it yet. Watch. It's on my list. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah in, in a way, the thing that is sort of kind of required is an entire reprogramming of our mind to sort right. of get rid of these tribalistic instincts in it, in ourselves. But I would say, for myself at the very least, the best litmus test that I've been able to come up with to determine whether or not someone actually knows their metal when it comes to someone that they're criticizing is how well they're able to steel man the oppositional viewpoints mm -hmm. position. So there's a clear difference between someone who makes a claim on another person's behalf. There's a clear difference whether that claim is coming from someone whom they already agree with. And so they're listening to what Ben Shapiro's viewpoints of the other person is saying rather than actually listening to the other person. Exactly. And yes, yeah, so there's a clear uh, difference there. And so for me, the way I, I – there. I always go back to what Douglas Murray says, um, and, and he didn't say it in, in this context, but I think it applies, where – I promise you the water's not that deep. It's not that cold when you jump in. So it's perfectly fine. You know, I, I get it. I get this tendency, this visceral tendency to not want to listen to Vosh, to not want to listen to these very far lefties or these far righties or, or what, because well, you have this emotional visceral reaction towards it. Right. But once you really jump into the water, you sort of kind of get addicted to it. I've right. read way more conservative books than I've read liberal books, and it's not because I'm a conservative. It's because for some strange reason, I have this fascination with things that I disagree with. And so I would say, at the risk of sounding like I have an inflated opinion on myself, I can I can steel man the, their, their viewpoints pretty well, you know, well enough to the point where I can give myself a, you know, I, I can give myself a little mini award, I suppose. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, what would you say is your solution to this problem? H how do we convince people to listen to people that they don't agree with or that they've been told that they shouldn't agree with? It's a really difficult problem for me. 
It's a huge problem, and I don't know that you can do it. I don't know that you can force people to pay attention um, to things that they don't want to pay attention to. You know, what we can also do, however, is look at, like, our own journeys to get to this place. And for me, I might have ended up in the same place regardless, because I've always had a bit of a contrarian streak. But what really was the catalyst for me of, like, pushing me off on this um sort of cognitive, emotional, and intellectual journey away from being a sort of knee-jerk progressive was being canceled, was being criticized um, for something I didn't think I did wrong. I wrote this piece on detransitioners and then there was this crazy outcry. And for me, that was the first, when people started criticizing the piece in a way that was, uh, that it was like they hadn't read it, right? The, the criticism was about like my, like I, could, I shouldn't be able to write this piece because I'm not transgender or whatever. Um, that was that to me was like the first sort of a sort of crack in and what had been um i think a pretty a fairly dogmatic uh ideological position that i'd had for my entire life um and and i think that's true of a lot of people that once you once you are accused falsely accused of something or once you're the one on sort of the chopping block it opens your minds um and the bad thing is that that can be a very emotionally difficult and trying experience and like people will kill themselves. The good thing is that it happens all the time, you know? So the more people who get canceled, the more people have this sort of eye-opening experience where you say, wait a second, if my side is wrong about this, wrong about me, what else are they wrong about? And that's a very powerful experience. Um, you know, that's, I don't know that, maybe people call it the red pill or something. I don't know that that's quite the correct metaphor. Um, but that is that is what happened to me, and I think that's happened. That's what's happened to a lot of a lot of my peers in this space. Is that it takes it takes some sort of um, personal experience. Maybe a friend of yours is is falsely accused of something, or you're falsely accused of something, and that's the first real crack that says, uh, "Wait a second, I this isn't working. This tribalism is not serving me. What is truth?" That appears to be what what really gets people um, on board. I mean, like I remember when you know when I was more woke, and I, I had a friend of mine who was who's always been anti-religious. But when I heard him criticize Islam, he sounded. I thought this is no to our audience. This is how he used to think. Mm -hmm. I, my my instincts was: Did you just suddenly become a Republican? But because he yes. was such a careful thinker, right. I looked into it. It's like, oh my God, this is what you, this is what you meant. And then right. uh, you you see this repeat itself. Um, gradually with people over the years, all of a sudden, like just a few weeks ago, we get Glenn Greenwald. Glenn Greenwald, right? Um, get uh, so suddenly, suddenly joined forces um, uh, 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 with us, and it's like th this seems to be like um, um, how things are, are going. Yeah, and one of my sort of favorite recent sort of friendships is is Glenn Greenwald and Barry Weiss. Glenn, what has been vicious towards Barry for years because she Barry is a Zionist. And, uh, but they, they went through a sort of similar experience. And now you see Barry and Glenn sort of, um, sort of retweeting each other and, and friendly on, on Twitter. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very surprising little coalition that is building there. Anyways, um, Katie Herzog, I want to thank you endlessly for coming on the podcast. This was yeah. certainly enlightening. You have one of the best podcasts out there. As I said, um, my sister quite enjoys your bombastic <laughs> nature on the podcast. Blocked and reported. Everyone go check it out. You have great articles out there. Um, I think I think you are one of the most prolific writers that we currently have who isn't afraid to get into the deep water. So thank you so much for uh, gracing us with your presence on this podcast. This was fantastic. Oh, thank you guys for having me. It's been fun talking with you.